On this episode of Made in America, I'm with Marietta Lee, Vice President and Corporate Secretary of the Lee Company, and we're talking about some really great stuff, including the 70-plus year history of their great company, as well as why employee culture is so important to success in today's manufacturing environment. It's a great episode. Don't go anywhere. Hey, it's Ari Santiago. Welcome to the Made in America podcast. I'm really excited to have Marietta Lee, Vice President and Corporate Secretary of the Lee Company on today. Uh, they've got over a million square feet and a thousand employees here in Connecticut. I'm really excited to talk to Marietta about her views on manufacturing Connecticut, where things are going, uh, and just what we can do to improve the business climate here in the state. Marietta, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate your time. Well, thanks for having me. Pleased to be here. Uh, absolutely. Well, listen, it's Married in America podcast, so we start off with the same questions. What do you make? And why do you make it? So we make, uh, and it's a mouthful, we make miniature hydraulic components for aerospace, medical, and automotive applications. So basically little metal widgets that help control flow in various hydraulic systems. Uh, and why do we make it? Um, that's a good question. My grandfather started the business over 70 years ago, and he was sort of a mad inventor. And he uh, invented some great, great products, and there was a market for them. And he started making them basically in his garage, and it went from there. Yeah, and here we are today with over a thousand in place. So I, I know, I think I read your father kind of actually started an aerospace company in Hartford um, initially, your grandfather rather, and then ended up moving the the family and the company down to the sure, shoreline. Sure, sure. So he um, he had a small building uh, in the Hartford area where he was. Um, making his making his things. And then um, he really liked an area of Guilford, Connecticut on the water. He was a big sailor. So he moved the family there um, many, many years ago. And then interestingly enough, people say, why are you in Westbrook, Connecticut? Uh, in the early days, he would have to test the parts on actual jet engines, <laughs> uh, which you don't have to do now. They have systems you can mimic a jet engine um, condition with a nice test stand that's quiet and controlled. But right. back in the day, he would have to test them on an actual jet engines. So he bought some land in the middle of nowhere where he could set up his jet engine in this little hut and <laughs> and not disturb the neighbors and um, test his parts. So we're in sort of a strange place for a, for a big company to be, but that's the story that's behind it. Be. Yeah, the, the, the neighbors in uh, Guilford didn't want people running jet engines in their backyard. Right, yeah. Or, you know, Hartford, that that was probably going to create some issues. So, yeah, so he found some sense. remote land in Westbrook and, and uh, the building's still there. It's obviously been renovated and now has some offices in it, but it was basically a hut with a jet engine. Wow, that's really it's really interesting. It's so fascinating. There's so many family businesses in Connecticut, especially kind of manufacturing. So kind of like to talk about the history a little bit. So, I mean, you're now third generation, right, um, you know, in the business. So maybe just sort of talk about kind of how the family businesses run. And, you know, I think you weren't in it the whole time. So your entire career. So maybe just talk a no, little bit about No, no. So my then. grandfather started um, pretty much on his own. Uh, and over the years, got um, four of his sons to come and help him run the business uh, in varying capacities. And eventually, um, as my grandfather got ready to retire, he had my father, um, his namesake. They're both named Layton. So Layton two was my grandfather. Layton three is my father. So Layton three took over for Layton two. Um, and it was a good transition because my grandfather was sort of this mad inventor type, developing all these products and just a great engineer. And my father, while also an engineer, was a, is a lawyer and um, was able to use his business acumen to sort of bring the business to the next level and sort of make it more of a business and um, set it up for future growth. So how much would, I mean, in this, I don't know if you even know all these details, but you know, what was the size of the company when your father took over, you know, how much has it grown kind of under his? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think when he took over, there were just a couple hundred employees and a couple buildings. And now, you know, we're 1200 employees and I think we have 14 13 or 14 buildings. So uh, it's grown exponentially yeah, over the years that's for that's sure. Great. Yeah. And so um, what do you guys, so you make, you make the miniaturized parts that you mentioned that really have to do with, I'm sorry, but like met, like flow with, with managing flow. Is that what we said? Right. So in a fuel system, making sure the fuel 
goes in the right direction. Um, a lot of the components, say on an airplane, um, you know, the hydraulic system that opens the hatch uh, that has the landing gear in it and then lowers the landing gear and then, you know, secures the landing gear. So all sorts of strange applications, anything where you're trying to control flow in a system. Okay. And so the business is what? You mentioned aerospace, you mentioned medical device and automotive. Like how does that kind of break out? In terms I would of say the- rough guess, we're probably about 60% aerospace. Um, another 20% is automotive and then 20% is medical and other miscellaneous uh, strange applications. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about your background. You didn't start in manufacturing. You didn't grow up in manufacturing. Um, and you aren't really an engineer. So how did you, yeah, kind of, how what did was I your wind path, up here? What was your path to um, uh, the Lee company? You know, uh, I left for college. I decided that I wanted to go into journalism. And I thought the avenue to do that was at the time, a lot of um, journalists were attorneys and right. they were, you know, pro- they would hire former prosecutors to come on TV and comment on court cases and such like that things like that. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, There was a TV station, Court TV. They were doing live trial coverage. It was very cool. So I thought, all right. I remember the OJ trial, right? OJ trial. Wall to wall, Court TV. It was a big, it it was a big deal at the time. So I thought, all right, I'm going to go to undergrad and then I'm going to go to law school because I was living in Washington, D.C. And most um, people in Washington, D.C. seem to be lawyers. And that just seemed like the logical thing to do. But I I was going to use my law degree, not really to practice law, but to get into journalism, which I was able to do. Uh, So I went to law school and then I went um, and during law school, I had worked for um, CBS News being the researcher for their Supreme Court correspondence. So I was able to have access to the Supreme Court, go to all the cases, read all the briefs, prepare stuff for him. So when court decisions came down, he didn't have to actually do all that. He just had the highlights and he was ready to go on air. So that was super fun. And then after Law school, I got a job working for the ABC affiliate down in Houston, Texas, and they had an um, investigative unit that um, wasn't doing like consumer complaint investigation type stuff. They were actually doing public corruption and fraud. Oh, wow. Um, and the uh, reporter who I worked for was very well known in the community because he busted open all these cases. So they need a, <laughs> an unknown person to, to be able to come in and do all the undercover work. Oh, and I was from out of town and I had a law degree and they had been su- like every story that they ever aired, they get sued they get on. Sued. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. So they liked me and they hired me and I went down there and my first assignment Now, mind you, like I did live in D.C., but really, I grew up in a little town in Connecticut. (laughs) Right. So I show up and I'm like in my Talbot's head headband and like my little skirt. And they're like, "Okay, tonight you're going to go to a strip club. (laughs) I was like, wait, wait, what? A strip club? They're like, yeah, we think um, we have it on good authority that the fire inspectors, the on duty fire inspectors aren't actually inspecting inspecting buildings. They're at strip clubs. So they put me in like a red wig and high heels and. Like I'd never been to a strip club, <laughs> nonetheless, by myself as a female. And I had, you know, the camera and the eyeglasses, the no camera kidding. and the purse and all this stuff. And we got lucky and we caught them. And um, in a weird twist, um, we're getting ready to air the story. And this giant chemical warehouse burns down in Houston. I mean, a huge fire. The whole waterfront practically burns to the ground. And so we're like, you know what? Let's um, let's get the records on when that building was last inspected by the fire officials. And sure enough, again, complete luck. Um, they had falsified the records and said that the night that I had them all at the strip club, was the they, were they were inspecting that building. That specific yeah, building. Yeah, I mean, so it was like a great story and super fun. And then there were many other crazy stories after that um and that was that was a fun job for a young attorney yeah you know looking to get into tv and then um shortly thereafter though i was hired to go work for court tv at in their washington dc office you ended up back in dc back in dc 
doing court TV, um, doing some on-air stuff covering the Supreme Court, doing a lot of producing around the Justice Department, FBI, Supreme Court, things things like so that. So the line from, uh, you know, a JD in D.C. to investigative journalist extraordinaire down in uh, Houston, back to court TV uh, and doing that in D.C., back to the lead company is super obvious, I assume, it's to everybody. It's so obvious. Yeah, listen to I, yeah, this. <laughs> and then, so how do you get, how yeah. do you get from there Because I see the connection right from court TV. Per- talking about yeah, manufacturing. Yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah. So then, um, then a couple other TV jobs decide have kids decide. You know what? I really want to be around family. my family, which is back in Connecticut. My husband's family was in Rhode Island, and um, decided that we would move back and uh, moved back and was interviewing for jobs in journalism around here, and was approached by my father, who said, "Why don't you join um, our manufacturing business?" And I said. Thanks, Dad. No. <laughs> uh, and then I thought about it for a while, um, and I decided, you know what? Maybe I will. Maybe this is a really good opportunity. And you know, the journalism stuff was super fun. I had a really good run, but we have this great business, and mm-hmm. we have great employees, and there is something to be said for that. And I really didn't know anything about manufacturing at all. Um, and he. He said, uh, I said, well, can I come in and talk to some people about the different job openings? And he said, no. I said, well, why, why not? He said, well, these are, the, these are your two choices of jobs. I said, well, can I come meet with the boss of both of those jobs and see what I think? And he said, no. I said, well, why not? And he said, because the person who you don't pick is going to always wonder why you didn't pick them. And it's going to be this weird thing. And like, you just have to decide and that's going to be it. I said, okay. What were the two jobs? It was working in HR or uh, working in facilities. Okay. And so for whatever reason, I decided facilities made more sense because uh, of my TV production background. I was really good at organizing things and, you know, facilities and making sure machines are running and buildings are built. That's sort of an organizational skill. So maybe the skills will translate. So he said, okay, well, we're going to hire you as the assistant facilities manager. Um, and in the family employment policy, um, when you're, you take a job at the company, you obviously have to, there has to be opening, you have to be qualified for it, and you have to at least initially take less than the going rate for that job. So it doesn't, you're not, you know, cashing in on your last name. Sure. So uh, he says, okay, you're the assistant facilities manager, but really he called me the assistant janitor. <laughs> and uh, I show up my first day and my office is about the size of this table. It, I think it had been a closet and they just <laughs> kind of jammed it. And he said, well, I don't want it to look like you're being treated. And you know, any, any better, right. This might be okay, the reverse of that, sure, right? I'm yeah. pretty sure no one's going to think that right. here. Like people would come in to say hi to me and they'd be like, wait, wait, what? This is your <laughs> office? <laughs> Sit yeah, okay, yeah. it is. And so um, anyway, I worked sort of uh, learning about facilities and all of that. And then the facilities manager retired. So then I took his position and then um, did that for many years. And it was a... It was good. We were building new buildings. We were expanding a lot. There was there was a lot to do. This was in the early 2000s. In right? the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. And then uh, eventually they said, okay, um, we'll put you in charge of one of the product groups. So I was um, in charge of one of the aerospace product groups for many years. And then um, probably about seven years ago, moved to into running our automotive division. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And so over time, have you found kind of a little bit of a passion for manufacturing and what you guys are doing? I have. It's interesting. Um Even in, you know, it's only been 18 years or so that I've worked in manufacturing, but manufacturing is really changing a lot. Um, There's a lot of automation going on. Um, You know, we're moving away from an era of manufacturing where it was highly skilled um, tool makers and machinists that spent their whole career learning how to make little widgets Mm -hmm. uh, into an arena of manufacturing where now there's so much technology and um, all the computers and everything where um, it's like a, a, a different skill set now. Yeah, almost, almost like an IT kind of a job. An IT kind of a job, yeah. yeah. So it definitely has changed. And um, I think what I try to do and I think what a lot of organizations across the country are trying to do is really talk about um, how manufacturing actually is a great career to be in mm-hmm. because 
it used to be parents wanted their kids to be lawyers and doctors or teachers and manufacturing was looked down upon. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we're trying to change that tide. I mean, it's it's definitely a work in process mm -hmm. for sure. But I, I saw some recent numbers that the average manufacturing salary in Connecticut, which really surprised me, was $95,000 a year. The average salary overall in Connecticut is $74,000 a year. So you, I, I think there's just a myth out there that manufacturing is dirty. You don't get paid well. You're exposed to chemicals, you know, all that stuff. And that is absolutely not not the truth, at least not at the Lee company. I can right. tell you that. Yeah. And the Lee company employs a bunch of people. So you guys, ought yeah. to, you guys ought to know one of the bigger employers in the state. So, and manufacturing. So let's just talk a little bit about, you know, that the, how you feel about the way your family kind of brought you into the business. Do you like that? And, and you listen, I mean, you took to it, you went and got a degree in, uh, you know, engineering management. So mm -hmm. you've really, really dug into it the way that they got you into it. You, does that, you think that was the right way to do it? Did it work? Well, they got me there. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So it, it worked. Um, you know, we have, I, I, yeah, I think I, I sort of came around to it. Um, you know, they asked and I said no. And then I thought about it and I said, you know what? Yeah, let me, let me do this. And I think it's a good opportunity. And oh, you, you mean, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important. And a lot of families, including ours, has a policy that kids coming out of school that are in family members have to go work somewhere else for a certain period of time to sort of, you know, test out the workforce yeah, and sure. do dumb things elsewhere when you're not under a microscope as a member of a family that owns the business. And um, so we we still have a policy like that in place. And I think that's tremendously important, not just for the person coming into the business, but also all the employees at the business don't feel like family members are getting special treatment. You know, they went out and got a job somewhere else and they worked and, and le learned new things. And brought some and outside. Like and not only that, maybe brought some outside experience Outs yes, as well. Even that better. Hurt. Even better. You know, yeah. some, there's sometimes those unique experiences that are even like kind of what I'll call off book, whether it's TV production or something else, really can kind of bring a unique and different perspective. I think that might be interesting for the company right. as well. Right. And, and working in a family business as a family member, I mean, you're you're under a microscope mm -hmm. in many respects. Like if you're you're not in the office on time, like everybody knows you're not in the <laughs> office on time. You, you're sort of held to a higher standard. And I think rightly so you, as a family member, you need to, you need to be at that higher standard. Yeah. I would imagine. So let's talk about what it's like to work at the Lee company. You talked about a little bit, we started talking about changing perceptions of manufacturing. I think that's so true. We hear that a lot on this podcast that, you know, people out there really need to know about kind of the new manufacturing. And I think part of it is the culture that's at a lot of these manufacturing organizations. It isn't like what people think of, you know, some old guy with a cigar, like, you know, breathing over your neck, you know, commanding you to do something mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. It's different. So what, what's it like at the Lee company? How would you describe sort of the culture of the business and, and what it's like to work there. So I think uh, we, as a family, um, work very hard on our culture uh, and how we act. I mean, we are probably more a medium-sized business, but we try very hard to act like a small business. And we try um, to treat our employees as family. And there is a great understanding among the family that if it were not for our employees, we wouldn't be as successful as we are. So we appreciate our employees so much and we appreciate everything that they do. We um, we have one of the first profit sharing plans in the country oh, really? uh, that still is very robust today. We offer um, as generous benefits as we can to our employees. Um, as we get closer to the holiday season, there's all sorts of um, you know, we have a company wide Christmas party that everybody is invited to. And I know many manufacturing companies, they'll have, you know, a Christmas party for the executives and then a, a Christmas party for the people that work on the floor. And we absolutely do not see that distinction at all. We're all in this together. And, um, you know, we try very hard to make everyone feel that they're appreciated because they very, very much are. That's fantastic. When you guys are looking to recruit and hire people for the Lee company, uh, I, I know it's a pretty big organization, so I don't know how kind of connected you are to that, but you know, what are you guys doing to recruit, um, you know, talent? It's a, it's a, it's a war out there for talent, right? Across the country and in Connecticut in particular as well, especially for skilled people in manufacturing. What are you guys doing to recruit? 
Uh, that is a great question. We're doing pretty much everything we can <laughs> uh, and more than we've ever really had to think about it because, you know, unemployment's at an all time low. There's not a lot of people that have manufacturing experience out there. So uh, our HR department is going to a lot of the schools to, you know, job fairs and things like that, trying to get young kids coming out of schools. We try to have uh, relationships with the technical schools and try to recruit kids out of those schools. Um, but it it's a challenge for, yeah, sure. for sure. And, uh, you know, we're we're a medium-sized company in Connecticut, but not everybody knows about us. And unless you've been there and or you know somebody that works there, you're probably not likely to, you know, we're not a big name like Sikorsky or, right, you know, right. something like that. Um, so a lot of it's word of mouth. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll put the word out, hey, we're looking for somebody for this. And, oh, my friend has a job over here. But if I told him there was a job here and I told him about it, maybe he'd come. So, um and we're doing things we've never done before, like radio ads and things like that. I mean, we're we never really had to pulling advertise. Up, pulling out yeah, all the stops. people would just show up and fill out an application, but times have changed. Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. And so, um, how has the employment changed in the Lee Company over the last, like, say, five years? And what do you guys see for the future from an employee growth perspective? Do you, has it grown in the last five years? Number of employees, and do you see that trend continuing? Sure. So we've we've grown over the past five years, and this is just off the top of my head, but I would say we've probably added. 150 employees over the past five years. So we are growing for okay. sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and hopefully, you know, knock on wood, things will continue to go well and we'll still continue to hire and, uh, be in need of employees. Oh, that's really great. So one of the things we, t we hear from a lot of folks is that part of the part of the recruiting strategy is retention. And you talked a lot about the Christmas party and the bonuses, and that's all great, right? Because we want to, if we want the number one thing to make sure we have the workforce we need is to keep the people that we mm -hmm. have in addition mm -hmm. to hiring. So um, how about training? You, do you guys do a lot of like incumbent worker training? Do you guys, have you guys taken advantage of any of the state programs that have helped with training? Like, is that anything that you're connected to? So we bring a lot of trainers in, um, mm -hmm. you know, we have classes like blueprint, blueprint reading classes and um, management classes and all that stuff. So we, we do bring uh, a lot of trainers in. We do send a lot of people out for training, um, specialty training on a specific machine or uh, a specific quality program that we have to adhere to. We'll send the quality people out. Uh, we also offer uh, a tuition reimbursement program. So if somebody wants to uh, finish an undergraduate degree or get an advanced degree. We Do you have a lot of restrictions on that? Does it have to be something that's specifically related to the business? Can it kind of flex? What, what What's your guys' position there? I don't know there? if I should say that on air, but um, <laughs> it should be related to uh, the job that they have or the job that they want to have, for sure. Like if somebody came in and said, I want to go back and get a degree in nursing, I might say, <laughs> Mm. Mm, there's not really any job here that that's relevant to. Probably but if MBA somebody or... said MBA or somebody said, I just want to get a, a undergraduate business degree or, you know, something like that or math or engineering sure, or anything sure. like that. Yeah. So flexibility within sure, kind of a broader, flexibility. you know, a broader. Yeah. Approach, and, so. it, and, and in terms of retention, you know, where I go to a lot of management conferences and they say, um, there's studies that have been done that what people, employees want is not necessarily more money. They want to feel appreciated and valued and that you're investing in them. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly we see that too. How do you guys actuate that? How do we act? Well, we do, we try to appreciate everyone as much as we can and um, continue with their training and, and be open to um, things that they want to do to improve themselves and improve themselves in their job. Do you, you know, there's a lot of talk about kind of manufacturing in Connecticut about how we can get more kind of high tech invest in technology. Um, what do you guys do in terms of technology investments? And I mean, are you guys investing in more like kind of CNC, five axis machines, robotics, any of that stuff kind of? All, I mean, we have a lot of we're uh, headed in the, in the direction of really a lot of automation. Um, and it is incredible to me because for the automotive division, I approve all the bills that come through. But how much money we spend in IT and computer programs and keeping the computers going and all of that. So much more than we do to keep the machines going. <laughs> um, 
I mean, the computers are keeping the machines, machines going, going right? in, so in a one bit sense, above. but um, right, right. it is, there's a huge investment in that. And we've Has that been a big seen, change over the last 18 years that you've... Certainly. And we've hired um, programmers and um, people that are specialists in automation and all of that. So, uh, you know, gone from hiring a highly, highly skilled machinist to hiring a couple programmers and automation engineers and all of that. So... It, it, the field is changing for yeah, sure. Starting to see that for change. Sure. So, you know, one thing I like to ask people is, you know, there's a, and you, and you're talking about kind of approving bills and, and making investments and spending. There's so many demands on our resources, right? So there's places to invest money. There's equipment, there's facilities that you're familiar with. There's IT, there's training we've talked about. There's recruiting advantage. I mean, there's bonuses, there's parties. How do, when you guys are looking at making investment decisions to the lead company, how do you go about making those decisions to determine where to put that capital, you know, the limited resources that we have. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And being a family owned business is great in the sense that we don't have to have some formal calculation, you know, what's the return on the investment? How long to, if we buy this machine, what's the payback period? And then present it to some panel <laughs> from the finance division. Da, da. I mean, we can go in and we can say, look, we think that such and such a company is going to hire us to make these parts and we think we need this machine and we're like 90% sure, but we got to get the machine on order before we get the order from this company and we're able to take risks and some, hopefully most of, the time the, <laughs> most of the time they work out, but sometimes they don't. And so we're able to be a little more flexible and nimble and not really um have to follow a set of rules so even at your size you guys have really still maintained that like nimble agility that a smaller company is more i mean listen in the grand scheme of companies i guess a thousand plus people is not huge but compared to most manufacturers we talk about a lot the average manufacturer probably has more like 20 or 30 people in it so from that standpoint it is huge but even at that large size you're still really able to be so nimble that's interesting yeah and it's it benefits us no in doubt. many ways in in that you know a smaller uh, or maybe even a bigger company that is less nimble uh, may not have gotten that job because they may not have been able to talk themselves into buying the expensive machine that would get them the job. Or so, it took them so long to fill out the paperwork and convince the, the committee right, the opportunity right, right, passed right, right. by before it was even right. was even purchased. So, you know, one of the things I find interesting in, in organizations that are nimble, or at least what I've seen to be successful, is they have to have the stomach, and you, know, you sort of touched on it a little bit, which is, when you're nimble, the benefits are you make some, you move quickly, but that also means sometimes you make some mistakes. And so I guess the organization has an appetite to accept some of those mistakes. Obviously, you want to have more wins than losses. Um, but that's really interesting that you guys have been able to take an approach of going, hey, you know, 90% chance, that sounds great, we're going to do it. And that when the thing doesn't pan out, you're able to just kind of move on from that and not not dwell on the things that don't work, but keep moving forward. Yeah. In theory. I mean, certainly there's a lot of backdoor discussions like, what the hell? <laughs> right, How well, did we go wrong with this? Sure, um, but and, you know, oftentimes uh, the calculation is, OK, if we buy this machine for this job that we don't have yet, like we're big enough that we could probably repurpose that machine and <laughs> make it work somewhere, somewhere else, else or something like that. So, um but yeah. Yeah. So I'm asking a question. You know, because you guys do you know do so much business, and you've got a big a big foot in aerospace, which you know I know is growing, and there's a lot of talk about that. But also in automotive and and other stuff as well. Like, how do you guys balance the different demands from those different industries? You know, aerospace is very highly regulated in a lot of ways. You've got the ITAR concerns and the, and the NIST or the DFAR security and mm -hmm. all that, which automotive doesn't necessarily have. I know uh, aerospace can tend to be higher priced components per component where where automotive tends to be lower cost, but bigger runs, it, right. you know, so they're, they're, you know, you talk to some of the smaller companies, they struggle to kind of mesh those, both of those needs. Right. How do you guys do that? Well, it's interesting. So we're, um, we're actually uh, divided into product groups, but we're actually physically divided into product groups. So for example, the automotive division has its own big manufacturing facility. It has its own set of engineers. It has its own quality team. Um, aerospace is in a couple different buildings, but they have their own quality team. Um, so it's almost like they run as different businesses. And we try to regularly get together and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like there, there's uh, something in the automotive industry that it, 
now aerospace looks like it's a, it's a quality standard and now it looks like aerospace is going to pick that up so the quality guys get together and they're like okay how how are we going to manage this how are we going to adapt to what it's a we're nice doing advantage for you guys actually. it is a good advantage um so but that's how we do it so you know if we were all in one big giant manufacturing build building and we had one quality team and one set of engineers and they were all trying to manage all these different standards and rules and regulations, it would get very, very complicated. Um, and, and was was all of this grown? And again, I know now I'm going back, you've been around, you're way younger than 70, so you don't remember all this stuff. But, you know, did it, did it sort of happen spontaneously that you guys got into all these different spaces? Was it was there acquisitions that sort of made that happen? Does it all grown organically? It was um, grown organically. And it, it in fact, in the early days, um, when my grandfather was running the business, we were all one big manufacturing company selling to different industries. And then when my father came in, he said, look, we are getting jammed up. We are not nimble. We're not able to get the parts out the door to the customer. Um, we need to we need to divide this into product groups, into different areas so that the the groups can be more nimble. They can meet customer demands. We don't have one log jam that's screwing up the thing for the whole thing. And so he was able to do that. And I mean, we did start as primarily uh, an aerospace business. And then um, about 30 years ago, uh, they decided to get into automotive. So the automotive division uh, in the history of the company is relatively new. Okay. Uh, and they did diversify into medical devices, uh, components for medical devices as well. And thank God that they did because um, between those three divisions, one is always struggling <laughs> and one is carrying the day and one's doing okay. So um, there is something to be said for not having all your eggs in one basket and um, the Over diversity the years, has been successful the for diversity you guys. has been successful yeah well wow, that's really interesting so when you're looking when you guys look to make just not to, just go back to maybe that investment conversation but just in general when you guys get together to look at what areas is it sort of the three different divisions kind of fighting over kind of who gets the most attention is it pretty collegial like how do you kind of balance those needs is it just where the customer demand is like you know how do you guys manage that yeah i would say it's probably where the customer demand is for sure i mean if one group one division is going gangbusters. Um, you know, they're just trying to get parts out the door. <laughs> uh, if one group is struggling, then, you know, the sales team is really working hard to try to sell products for that group, mm -hmm. um, the group that's struggling. So it's sort of a symbiotic. Nice. It just works, works somehow. Really so. That's yeah, great. so far, so good. And do you move people around? Like if I'm if I work for a lead company in aerospace, do I have the opportunity to go to a different division? Does that does that happen much or not? It does not happen much. It does sometimes happen when one division is seeing a decline and maybe they don't need all, you know, 200 people that are working in that division and another division is going gangbusters. They could use a few more people. We might move people around like that, but we try not to uh, do that. And and the reason why is really um, because a lot of times people have this perception that like my boss is just mean to me. If I could just get a better boss, everything <laughs> would be great. And so once you start moving people around, then people want to move to another group because they heard, oh, they have a better, they, you know, yeah, they have a better, better barbecue at, at Fourth of July over there. And, you know, so whatever. So we really tried to, you know, this is your group. This is your home. This is where you are. Um, but occasionally it does happen for sure. And are most of the like, HR and sales, are those resources like kind of shared throughout? Those are or? shared, yeah. Okay, so there's not kind so of... So finance, uh, sales, and HR are all shared between all the different divisions. So I know one thing that you've been pretty vocal about in the past is kind of the state of the business climate in Connecticut. I know you're very involved in CBIA. You're on the board. Lee Company has been a long time CBIA member, as has um, you know IT Direct, my company. And I think it's important in general for businesses to be engaged in the in the public discourse and be engaged mm -hmm. in their communities. So just kind of interested on your take. You know, why have you decided to get engaged? You know, in CBIA uh, and be involved in kind of that aspect of uh, of the, of the environment. Yeah, I mean, it's no secret that the economy in Connecticut is not terrific. It's not a terrific place to run a business. It's not a terrific place to live uh, other than, you know, obviously the location is terrific and the beaches are terrific and all of that. But schools financially, are pretty, schools, schools are, pretty are good. good. Mm -hmm. Financially, it's not um, not the easiest place. Um, and I think my involvement with CBIA has really been um, because I'm interested in 
making sure that the legislature that we elect is aware of some of the issues that businesses face. And when making important decisions, they consider not just how it may impact one sector of the Connecticut population, but also how it impacts businesses. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, when you're thinking about things, it's very hard to think about everybody that's going to be affected by it. And, um, you know, a lot of the people up in the state house have a business background, but a lot don't. Mm -hmm. And it's just not something at the forefront of their mind. And I think CBIA has done a good job um, getting up there and lobbying hard to help help people that are in charge of making those decisions understand what the real impacts. There, yeah. Do you yeah. get up there yourself personally or just really support the organization? Just supporting the Joe organization. And, we and we rely on them to do the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, we all have a day job, right? <laughs> um, do you get involved in other stuff in the community? Like, are you involved in any kind of local stuff down in either, you know, in Westbrook where the company is or yeah, where you live? Yeah. So I serve on um, the board of the Essex Savings Bank, which is a small bank on the shoreline. Um, and I also serve on our town's um, board of police commissioners as well. So. Oh, so you're so you're out there uh, doing other stuff in the community, right? As well, and why have you spent your time on that? Listen, you've got two you've got two kids. I guess well now they're not so young anymore, but right. you know you raised a family that takes a lot of you know it takes a lot of time. So why take time out to kind of be on you know be on those boards and, and engage like that? Um, I think you know throughout my whole life, even when the kids were young, I was always on volunteer boards and doing things like that. And I just think, uh, I think it's so important to give back to your community. And I love the town that I live in, Madison. So it's nice to be able to serve in a sort of a quasi-political role on the board of police commissioners, um, and that's something that's interesting to me. So it's it doesn't seem like work. Do we have a, Do we have a future political run? Uh, I your, don't know about that. I think uh, I'm pretty busy with other. I don't things. know. She didn't say no. I don't know. Maybe we're breaking some news. Uh, maybe we're breaking some news here. That'd be really exciting. Um, so what do you think the Lee Company does differently? Like, what's kind of the Lee's company? What what's the kind of unique proposition? What do you guys think is kind of the advantage that you guys have that's allowed you to be so successful? I mean, I really it's it's kind of an impressive um, a legacy, an impressive history, and an impressive future. Really, what, what what's allowed that? So I think um, you know we've talked a lot about you know how we value our employees, we value the community that we're in, we try to do things with the community, but also the sort of business proposition. Uh, what we do is we don't. Um, get blueprints from companies and say, we want you to make this valve. Here's the blueprint. Just make that for us. What we do is we try to solve problems for companies. So a company that ha calls us and says, we have a problem. Um, this, you know, hydraulic system isn't working the way we want it to. We want a part. We want you to design a part that's going to fix our problem. And that's what we like to do. We like, we're heavily engineer focused. We employ a lot of engineers and um, that's our favorite thing to do. Go to the customer, tell us your problem, we can fix it. And then we design and then we build the parts for them. Oh, that's pretty exciting. And is that is that really a legacy of the history of what started with your grandfather and continues to this day? That kind of problem solving, problem solving. engineering. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, grandfather's a bit of a tinkerer. That He's that a kind huge of tinkerer. Yeah. That, that that's kind of carried yeah. its way uh, through to today. I know there's been some like patents I think that were related to your grandfather, and so that's not really the company isn't really just selling kind of like specific Lee patented parts. It's actually solving problems uniquely that's, for customers. That's what we like to do. We certainly do have some off the shelf parts that um, solve problems for customers, sure, but course. they're just problems that everybody has. Sure, sure, so sure. So those were developed a long time ago, and they're just what we call standard products that everybody, everybody needs those. But what we really, really like is unique solving unique problems um, for customers. So I just want to ask you like a personal question, which is sort of like what, what drives you, Marietta, to be successful? I mean, I think, you know, your personal story is really interesting. You've been a success at really everything that you've done. So you maybe got lucky initially, but you kind of parlayed that luck. You've done, you've grown at the Lee Company. You're engaged in the community. You're doing so much. Like what kind of pushes you to succeed? What's kind of, what kind of drives oh, you? This is a deep question. <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about manufacturing. <laughs> uh, no, I think, you know, I feel very fortunate that our family has this big company and um, I feel like I owe it to the employees and I owe it to the family to work hard every day to, to make it better for everybody. And so I certainly don't want anybody to think that I'm just there um, because I have the right last name. Clearly not. Yeah. And um, so that's what drives me. And I, I, and there's a lot of, you know, 1200 people 
that rely on our business for their livelihood. And that's a lot of responsibility. And that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And it's not just the 1,200 people that work there. It's their families, too. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think anyone in upper management at the Lee Company, and especially those that have the last name Lee, like that's that's what drives us. Wow. That's really good, actually. That's very nice. Um, so we're kind of like going to wrap up before we get to uh, the rapid fire round of questions. You know, I know- Rapid fire? You did not clear rapid fire <laughs> questions with me. That's all right. Just kind of roll with it, Mariana. Oh, you know, just got to roll with the punches. This seems awfully rapid fire as it is. Uh, I no, can't no. believe there's more. There's okay. absolutely more. Oh. Yeah. So what do you think, you know, it's really interesting. I, I think it's always great to get business people's perspective on what we could do in Connecticut to improve the business climate. And I think, um, you know, the, the person that's- that was on last before you or the episode I think that will launch before yours is uh, David Lehman, who's the the commissioner of Department of Economic and Community Development. And, you know, we've recently, um, you know, they've announced the chief manufacturing officer for the state of Connecticut. I think it's clear in the numbers, can, the manufacturing continues to be one of the fastest growing employment uh, areas in Connecticut. I think in October of this year, it was just the number two fastest growing, but we're just seeing this growth over time. And there's seems to be a real openness in the current administration to do what's right, not just for business in general, which is true but even more so or really uh, also for manufacturing. And so with your long family history and your personal long experience, what do you think the government can do to help manufacturers in Connecticut? Yeah, I think what you just touched on is key that the first of all, that that uh, the government needs to realize that a lot of the driving engine, no matter what we're going to do to bring back Connecticut revolves around manufacturing. I mean, you know, you can have a computer company. Okay, well, you know, IT company, they service manufacturers, lawyers, they service manufacturers, accountants, they service manufacturers. So you've got to have somewhere in the core, somebody making stuff and right. all the other, other businesses sort of support that. Mm -hmm. And there's studies that show that you got to get manufacturing uh, back to Connecticut and you got to get that going. But on the same hand, right now, the economic climate here is so tenuous that anyone that wants to start a business or move a business, they're going to be hard pressed to pick Connecticut right now. So uh, I know, you know, Connecticut's offering, you know, grants and incentives and all of that. And I think that's important. But I also, uh, you know, and we're part of, of a program with the state, you know, to uh, continue to build our company in mm -hmm. exchange for um, certain support, perks. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all of that's important. But also, at the same time, you can't forget the people that are here. Mm -hmm running manufacturing companies. And those are the people that I really think they need to be supporting and working with and going after to keep them here and keep them building their businesses here and set an example for what, what a manufacturing company can look like in Connecticut. And then you go and you try to attract other manufacturing companies from other states to come here. So you're saying put a little bit of attention on the people that are here, get a better, yeah. a better, more stable business climate that can support the growth of the people that we have would be a great I, I first step. I think that's that's got to be the first step well, because very... any state can offer perks and incentives. Yeah. And look, my I actually probably get a couple calls every day from this is so and so from such and such a state. Just wanted to talk to you about maybe moving <laughs> here. I don't need. I I just delete. I just <laughs> I can't even listen to them all. There's so many, right. um, and I'm sure Connecticut's doing that <laughs> to other too. Well. Um, right. You know, I, I think we just really need to foster and promote what we've got already. And um, I, I think you're hundred percent right. I think there's nothing, nothing's going to be a better economic driver than a stable climate where we can rely on that. Our taxes aren't going to go up every year that we're investing in the right things like transportation and workforce development so that we can have a better economy where it's easier to get places and people to employ. I think that's the, you know, stability and that's great. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so I think that's great, and I, I, I'm glad that you're adding your voice to kind of that opinion because I think if more people that are saying that, the more attention it'll get, and it'll drive mm -hmm. a, a really good climate. That's really great. Um, well, listen, before we go to rapid fire, I want to ask you this question. We have um, one thing I like to ask is like, do you have a white whale customers? Kind of been what I call it. Is there a customer, and it can be on any part of your business that you guys would love to get kind of in front of someone you've been trying to get to maybe pick up the phone or engage in the Lee Company who might be able to see this video and go, you know what, I should give a Marietta a call and we should do more business with the Lee Company. Look, our sales team better have knocked on those that person's <laughs> door already. I, I'm really hoping that, that they're on that top of that. That we do not have a white whale customer. I do not think we do. I, yeah. I 
I am confident that our sales team has been so knocking on, on that, all those doors. Get in front of that. That sounds good. Well, if there is anyone the sales team wants to get in front of, when we publish this, they can they can link them in on uh, okay. LinkedIn and we'll, right. uh, and we'll get in front of Done. them. That's Done. really awesome. Okay, cool. Well, listen, I'm going to run to our uh, rapid fire I am terrified. round of questions. Okay. Don't be scared. They're really okay. easy. All right, here okay. we go. So they're, they're hot takes. So you just got to go with one. Ready? Here wait, we go. So wait, you're going to ask me a question? I'm going to ask you a question. One word answer? It's going to be like a this or a that type of a question. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Red Sox or Yankees? Red Sox. Yes. Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts? Ooh, it depends on the day and what I'm ordering. Okay. Uh, when you go away, you staycation or exotic destination? Somewhere in the middle. Okay. Uh, iPhone or Android? Oh, iPhone. Sports car or SUV? SUV. Uh, if you could do anything else in the world other than be the VP and corporate secretary for the Lee company, what would you do? I would be Beyonce. <laughs> Best answer ever. Um, do you have a favorite business book? Oh, uh, who moved my cheese? Oh, that's a really good one. I haven't said that one yet. Uh, what's one thing that you learned early in your career, or early in your life that you think propelled you to the success that you've had? Oh, that can't be on the rapid fire list. Um, I think one of the principles that I try to live by and that I learned early on um, is when you make a mistake, just own up to it and be honest and say, I blew it. Help me fix it. That's good. Uh, what's one thing you learned later in your life or later in your career that you wish you could go back and tell young Marietta that you think would have really helped her? Uh, don't be so opinionated. <laughs> there you go. Classic. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, so listen, we've been, we've been around, we've talked about a lot of really interesting stuff today. And as I mentioned to you kind of earlier, one of my important things is to give people something to take away from kind of listening to this. And I'm just curious of all the stuff we talked about, what do you, what would you pick out as like one of the gems that if someone was listening and wanted to take away something that we talked about today that they'd walk away from what's like kind of one of those takeaways you think would be really important from today? Um, I think just valuing your employees and really understanding that your employees are how, how you're successful and making sure that they're happy and they're treated well and their families are treated well and they feel valued is key to any business's success. I 100% agree with that. And on my end, I, I really enjoyed kind of the principled approach that your family has taken to bringing family members into the family business. And I think, you know, people respect something so much more when they've had to earn it. And that's regardless of whether it's a family business or not. And so putting someone into a position where they have the opportunity to work and to earn something, I think always makes them appreciate it more. I think that's kind of a, a side takeaway from what you had said. And I really appreciated that. So thank you so much, Marietta, for it's, being on today. It's been, it's been a real fun. pleasure to have yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct. As always, thanks so much for tuning in. I definitely want your feedback and hope you subscribe. But what I want the most is to build a community where we learn and grow with each other. I hope you're getting a lot of value out of the time we're spending together. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next time.